I offer these every week along with a guided meditation. Just click the uh, subscribe link below to be notified through YouTube when I post the latest recording. Or if you'd like to join us live, which would be great, uh, just go into the description section below and follow the link along to be able to sign up for free. So now I'd like to get in to the main talk here uh, while uh, beginning with an acknowledgement of the fact that may already be apparent to you. Uh, I have a mild cold. I'm fine. I'm okay. Uh, and, uh, you know, tea with honey is my friend. So to enter into this topic, I'd like to tell you where I was last week when we had a guest teacher. Uh, my father um, was born uh, in November 1918. And I say November, to, so, help you, so you can imagine what it was like there in the Badlands of North Dakota, in the southwestern corner of that state, where it was very, very cold. There was also a flu epidemic at the time, which um, actually, to my knowledge, um, killed uh, my father's mother, his grandmother, I believe. And so it was a home birth attended by a a midwife originally from Norway. So you just imagine in the snowy ranching, you know, uh, back country of North Dakota, the midwife riding her horse to a house with walls made of sod, sod, dirt and grass, two to three feet thick, in which uh, my grandmother was laboring, literally, uh, to give birth to my father. There they were on their own. Wow. And then my dad grew up there. He grew up on the logging camp ranch in North Dakota, and which is still in the family, operated primarily now by my cousin um, and uh, John and his wife, Jennifer. And uh, so I was there for about a week and got to spend more time there than I had previously ever done before. Uh, although I'd visited, you know, a number of times just for a couple days typically at a time. It was really quite something. And the reason I'm telling you all this is that it's an introduction to or a way into uh, my topic tonight. And I've searched for a less fancy title than coalescing and dispersing. Please help me. <laughs> Feel free to suggest, you know, titles more like centering and expanding. Yeah, that's pretty, that's a pretty good one. Um, letting in and letting go. There we go. That's, that's pretty good too. So if you've ever spent much time in physical vastness, maybe in the ocean, far from land, perhaps, or in vast lands like prairies or mountains, particularly with a sense of isolation, and disengagement from uh, most people. There's something about that that affects your consciousness. It affected mine. There's a vastness. There's an opening outness. And as you may have heard me speak, uh, new research on brain science has something to say here in which it points out that both the sense of spaciousness, uh, including a sense of things as a whole, including a panoramic perspective, including a bird's eye view, and including lifting the gaze to the horizon line or above, all of that, those, those different uh, practices, which sometimes come together, uh, can uh, release us uh, from um, neural activity. They reduce neural activity in parts of the brain that uh, are a key basis for uh, a contracted, pressured sense of self. So when we lift our gaze or get a sense of spaciousness, a sense of vastness all around us, huh? less me and more everything. which typically involves, in addition to lessening of activity in midline cortex, and especially spreading to the rear in the so-called default mode network, 
more activation in networks on the sides of the brain, particularly the right side of the brain for right-handed people, because that's the part of the brain that's very involved with holistic gestalt awareness of things as a whole. <clears throat> so there we have the dispersing, the opening out quality, which was a great relief for me given how much of my work, like that of many, many people, is about coalescing around, focusing on particular things. It's not bad, but for myself, and I think for most of us in technical industrial societies or types of work, uh, it tends to be way out of balance. The element of um, coalescing is turbocharged in our modern societies, highly rewarded, and becomes extremely reinforced in terms of its underlying neural circuitry. And in that coalescing, typically it's so easy for that coalescing to involve a sense of contraction, pressure, craving, and suffering. It's a lot harder to crave naming here the second noble truth identified by the Buddha, it's really hard, it's a lot harder to crave when you're very expansive, when you're very dispersing outwardly. You can still do it, but it's a lot harder. So that aspect of opening, widening, widening your view, taking more into account, feeling more connected, to everything, it, that practice is a very fast track to suffering less, to being less anxious, less ruminating, less, less self-preoccupied, less irritable, less exasperated, less angry, less frustrated with various parts of the whole. Because now you've opened up and out to the whole. Now, all this could kind of sound sort of abstract, but um, it actually becomes very felt. And it's quite poignant if you ask yourself, how often in your day do you lift up and out of whatever tasks have gripped you, hijacked you? On, I talked earlier, you know, about the awaken, you know, the awakening meadow and the neurosis express, right? Well, there's the task express. I've spent a lot of time on that choo-choo train. Uh, so, to you, think of a typical day. How often do you lift your gaze from the immediate task, or do you pull your mind up and out of it? How to get a sense of the larger whole? How often in interacting with someone, especially if it's at all heated or gripping, <clears throat> how often do you kind of step back, pull up, slow it down, step out of the script? How often do we do that? Right there is a very practical method for suffering less in daily life and causing less suffering for other people. I really invite you to comment on this um, dynamic. Think of it as almost like a dance step. We step in, we step back. Step in, step back. How much time do we spend in, 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 in? before we take refuge and find relief in stepping back. And you might put in the chat or reflect for yourself, what helps you? What helps you open the hand? There's a term in Zen, to open the hand of thought to let the contractedness of a thought, a belief, 
a fixed view. Open the hand of thought. What helps you? Open the hand of thought. What helps you to disidentify from the positions, the views that you take over the course of your day? Looking up at the sky, I see that, naps, lying down, joking, humor is very good, right on medicine, and otherwise. This is profound practice in action. In, in this very simple movement to step back <clears throat> from the coalescences, the parts of the larger whole that capture us, that simple movement to step back and open out um, is both extremely practical in everyday life and it embodies the deep processes of awakening taught by the Buddha and practiced by millions of people for thousands of years in which there's a releasing, a lessening of the contracted grip of, the, of you know, me and mine it's a lessening of that. And then there's an opening out into oneness and everything, which can include, if it's real for you, an intuition, uh, a felt a sense of the uh, unconditioned ground of all. Very powerful, right? So let me take a peek at comments that have come in so far and to see if I'm uh, <laughs> if I'm doing okay. Uh, let's see here. Okay, good. So, um, in this life, there's this balance of, in a way, gathering. That's a good word, gathering. And Dispersing, coalescing, opening. And we need to do both. We really need to do both. Uh, one thing that also struck me extremely in the, the rural setting of the Logging Camp Ranch, uh, you can look it up online, uh, Logging Camp Ranch Resort. You know, to put in a bit of a plug for uh, their... Uh, their cabins they, they they rent there. They're just wonderful. They really are wonderful. You can check it out. Um, you can look at it on TripAdvisor. And uh, it's very inexpensive, incredible place. Um, about a three-hour drive from Bris Bismarck, North Dakota. Uh, and, and it's in the middle of a working ranch, roughly 15 square miles, either owned by the family or operated by it. Uh, and it's the real deal. And it's been the real deal for now, well over 100 years. So <clears throat> one thing that becomes very clear, especially for a, a city, a city fellow, a city slicker like me, a tenderfoot like me, wow, is the incredible sweat equity, the investment of what you see there from um, the people who settled that land with also in the tragedy alongside it of the displacement of the native people. Uh, my father as a boy found numerous arrowheads left behind uh, on the land. Uh, there are signs of uh, the native people who lived there and, and you just know that they lived there. They fished in the little Missouri River that runs through the property. I mean, it's very real. And so um, it's bittersweet to appreciate the hard work and effort, the fences laid out over the land, you know, the, the, the houses built, um, the, the rivers forded, the bridges made. Uh, the schools constructed. My father went to a one-room schoolhouse, classic, about a mile and a half away, you know, nearest neighbor, 
two miles in that direction, five miles in that direction, one mile in that direction. They had to cross the Little Missouri River to get there and back every day. In the, the winter of North Dakota, uh, wow, you know, there's a lot. So you're, you become aware of the value of the coalescences that we do make. We do make the meals we prepare, the emails we send, the books we write, the talks we give, uh, you know, the hands we help with. It's all extremely valuable, extremely valuable. And in a setting like, uh, you know, Slope County, North Dakota, which had, I believe, the lowest population density of any county in America uh, when my father grew up, its county seat, Amadon, has the distinction of being the second, uh, how can I put it, the county seat with the second smallest population of any county in America today. 24 people. I think there might be a county seat somewhere else with 20 or 22. I don't know. But anyway, um, yeah. So you really, you have a sense of tenderness and intimacy with that which is coalesced, that which is gathered together right? That which is made. So we have these two, these two truths, don't we? We have them in reality. We have the universe all together, and we have the coalescing of Jupiter, right? the coalescing of our moon, the coalescing of the remnants of a meteorite, uh, you know, or a meteorite, the remnants of a meteor that has actually fallen to this earth. I mean, wow. Uh, we have in our bodies the coalescences of all the atoms bigger than helium that were built inside an exploding star. Whoa. You know, so we have these two truths. We have the truth of something and nothing. We have the truth of um, formations and emptiness. We have these two truths side by side. So what do we do with them? You know, we could be all abstract about it, and I really don't want to be that way here. I really want to invite you into the kind of intimacy, really, I felt with both of these truths while I was, you know, spending a week there um, at the Logging Camp Ranch and in nearby areas, including a rodeo on July 4th in the small town of Marmoth, North Dakota. Uh, wow. So in your life, what is the balance for you of coalescing, of gathering, of tending appropriately to parts of the whole, on the one hand, and dispersing, opening out, releasing? I use the metaphor in my book, Neurodharma, and elsewhere of eddies in the stream. Eddies are a coalescing. Everything is an eddy. The eddying of a thought arising, coalescing, and then dispersing. The eddy of a rock coming together due to causes and conditions over millions of years, etc. The eddy coming together of a galaxy. The super eddy of the whole Big Bang universe, you know, which is, is gradually dispersing over time. Uh, all eddies disperse eventually. So in your own life, what is the balance of these two forces? And what wisdom, what intuition might you have now about them? On the one hand, might there be some things that would be good for you to gather together? Is it time to come to some resolution with another person about some grievance you have with them. In other words, to come to, to bring things together so they can somehow complete. Is it time to uh, get a grip on uh, your finances as you age uh, and your kind of plan for the remainder of your life? You know, is it time to pull that together? Uh, is it time to finally organize that kitchen drawer? Is it time to finally 
speak from your heart and say something really important to another person. Is it time to gather together some important routines in your life? Uh, <clears throat> I think in many ways uh, <clears throat> the difference between being healthy and not healthy, in a lot of ways, the difference between having uh, most, if not all, of the well-being you want or not, it really boils down to about an hour a day. About an hour a day of getting more activity, more exercise into your life, you know, and an hour a day that includes getting more activity and exercise into your life, uh, an hour a day that includes more deliberate, personal, contemplative practice, spiritual practice, some kind of inner practice, you know, an hour in a day that includes some tender, sweet kindness to yourself. You know, if, if only just sitting and looking out the window and, you know, <laughs> Lay, letting laying down your burdens for that time and just abiding, just simply being, you know, is the time to gather that hour together and to uh, coalesce it in your life and coalesce protections and routines related to it and agreements with other people so they won't disturb it. Is that there for you? Is it time in your own mind to coalesce, to gather certain understandings with yourself, such as, is it time to really acknowledge what a good person you are? Is it, is it time to just really go, you know, I messed up. Yeah, I'm speaking to myself here. I messed up in a bunch of ways. Gotcha. Whew. Okay, still, on the whole, a good person. You know, is it time to coalesce that understanding? As a detail, I've been recently just reflecting on the obvious that for myself and for you and for almost everyone, the vast bulk of your life and the vast bulk of your consciousness right now is positive, was decent, effortful, kind, well-intended, you know, good. Well, if the vast bulk of um, your life has been good in all kinds of ways, uh, wouldn't it be a fair and appropriate for the vast bulk of your view of yourself to be affirming and positive? and the vast bulk of your own experience of yourself and treatment of yourself to be positive. Uh, yeah, so that's a coalescing. You know, can there be a fundamental forgiving of all that's come before and a giving of a fresh start for yourself? That's a coalescing. Being determined. The Buddha um, has a recurring, I love these recurring phrases in uh, the texts of early Buddhism that have come down to us. And one of uh, the recurring phrases that I, I really appreciate a lot essentially says, um, one is um, worthy of respect in a Buddhist frame broadly, or in life altogether, you see for yourself. One is worthy of respect who is ardent, which is to say heartfelt, enthusiastic, passionate for the good. One who is ardent, resolute, which is to say committed, determined, firm in their direction, even if they 
you know, get bumped off course or need to slack off for a while or, you know, they slip and fall off the trail. Still, fundamentally, they're resolute. Third, diligent. They keep turning the wheel. <laughs> yeah. They make efforts, you know, not uh, so that beads of sweat are popping out on their forehead and they're driving other people crazy, but, you know, they, they stick with it. They're, they're persistent at the pace of sustaining a, you know, a marathon each day and the ultra marathon of a life. They're diligent. And last, mindful. They're aware of the inner and the outer world. They can track their own processes in real time. Ardent, resolute, diligent, and mindful. These are coalescences. These, these qualities, these virtues come together. They're, they're worthy of feeding and nurturing and protecting and cultivating over time. Okay. On the other hand, for you... For me, what is the place for expansiveness, dispersal, opening out? For example, I want to offer some um, factors of that and some feelings of that. For one, it's to step out of the scripts that in which we are coalesced, we are contracted. Just stepping out of scripts, pausing, stepping back from them, asking yourself if there's a better way. Just that. That's that kind of opening. Oh. Another, not knowing. As they say in Korean Zen, don't know mind. Or beginner's mind, Suzuki Roshi put it. Or just child mind. Don't know. Don't know. Don't know, pulls us up and out. Another, is simply to have a sense of your own consciousness, your own mind, um, opening outward, spreading, and without an edge to it, in a sense. Don't try to think about this too much opening outward opening another is really summarized in the wonderful teaching from T.S. Eliot which uh, I've quoted many times um, from his beautiful poem Ash Wednesday which is kind of a prayerful poem and he says in it teach us to care and not to care followed by the line, teach us to sit still. Teach us to care and not to care. Huh. And the caring, you could say, is a, involves typically a coalescing. You know, we want to be helpful. Uh, we, we care about someone. We go out of our way. Uh, and not caring in the healthy sense is a kind of, whew, opening out into the sweep of time and space. One of the things that really landed for me in North Dakota was just a sense of uh, <laughs> the smallness of my own life in terms of time and space, the smallness of any life. Uh, this is the side of the truth that goes to, it's more like, wow, not like, not getting contracted in forms of caring, just, oh, vastness. So you might feel that. And I think I'll finish in a moment and then see what your comments are and respond to questions and so on. And to underline a real point here that um, I'm really talking about something that I think is absolutely fundamental and deep and really worth being aware of, the movement, gathering together, opening out, gathering together, opening out. And if you're like me, you might take a real look 
at those two and ask yourself, huh, which of these two movements of the heart, movements of the mind, which of these two movements would be really good on the whole to prioritize in my life these days? And which of these two movements, huh, would Bennett w- would be worth me yeah, being a little more skeptical of, having a little bit more of a hmm, jaundiced view of? Well, I could tell you for me, it's about dispersal, opening out. Uh, there's a good chance that whatever you're really good at, <laughs> it's the other one that could really call to you. Now, some people are really good at spacing out, uh, you know, and... Uh, hello, you want to say to them, right? Hello, Earth to Bob, (laughs) right? Uh, Hello, come on back. You know, 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 every kite needs someone to hold the string if it's going to soar. But most of us, I think, we'd we'd be really aided by more of an expansive vastness in our, in our, in the movements of our heart. Uh, and so to finish, and I hope it won't rile you up here, I'm going to make a comment related to uh, the world and how to relate to all, you know, just all that keeps happening in the world, including in uh, economic and cultural and political arenas. How do we relate to it? And I just want to gently suggest that this framework I've offered here of co- you know, coalescing and dispersing, expanding <laughs> can be really, can be useful. <laughs> I'm going to coalesce on some hot tea. In other words, We can look at anything, and I'm being deliberately very general here. Look at anything in the world. Uh, I'm myself particularly concerned with uh, global warming uh, and its growing consequences. So anything, other things I'm very concerned about too. Uh, We can on the one hand take a look at the movement of the heart that's about gathering or coalescing, which is involved in getting stuff done. Okay. Are there some things that I could be doing that, yeah, taking a lot into account, I would like to be doing that I'm not yet doing? Okay, that's coalescing. So maybe there are particular things in your community or or location, or country, or world, that, you know, you would like to actually coalesce around. It's time to do something. Maybe you're going to coalesce around sending a dollar a week to some nonprofit organization that's doing things you like. That's a coalescing. Okay, whatever that might be. And also, in terms of the other movement of the heart, you know, vastness, opening out, big picture. Whoosh. Is there some, maybe, is there opportunity over there for you? I can say for myself in America that as someone who, in my own case, is, I would say, quite well informed, um, you know, there's been a lot of preoccupied coalescings in my own mind stream. And it's been helpful for me uh, to be really clear about the things I'm going to be doing and am doing while bringing in more balance of big picture, long-term view, sweep of history, solar system, (laughs) galaxy, universe. That's been helpful for me. And you might look to yourself. Uh, in terms of uh, these two movements of coalescing and expanding, dispersing for yourself.
Okay. So I'm happy to have not lost 329 people yet. I'm one of the 330 in the Zoom count. Let me see what's come through. Wonderful comments so far. And I love that Oscar Wilde comment. What? Some of us, <laughs> we're all in the gutter, but some of us are looking at the stars, something like that. That's really great. Okay, great. Um, yeah. And I want to pick up on Barbara G's comment at 24 past. The, there can be tenderness in both. Coalescing is not bad. We need to coalesce to build a house, to teach a child to read, to, to write the book the child reads. Can we, but coalescing in our biologically evolved body and brain is right on the slippery slope. It's at the beginning of the slippery slope into contraction, pressure, selfing, and craving. So be careful. There are also pitfalls in dispersing. You know, the ultimate, you know, including ultimately de psychosis. So be careful if you're prone to any of that stuff. Depersonalization, fragmentation of this of the co necessary coherence of the psyche altogether. Ooh, be careful there. Uh, it's not that coalescing is bad and dispersing is good. You know, So the opportunity is to bring tenderness. I love that. Uh, uh, to both of these. Okay. So let's see here. You, you, <laughs> you like my mug, eh? I'm glad. You have taste. Good for you. Um, good for you, Diane. Um, let's see, a shot or two of brandy in that cup? No, I maybe tonight because I'm a little have a cold. You're wondering about if I've maybe a little mushroom powder in there? Nope. <laughs> this is a natural high. Okay. <clears throat> yeah. Okay. This is great. Jovian writes: um, In contractions, I can get overwhelmed and anxious, but. I need to be more comfortable with them. That's right. Can we be comfortable with necessary and healthy and useful coalescings? Well, even if they remind us of some of the, uh, you know, pressure defended contractions we needed to acquire in our armoring in our childhood or life altogether, you know, we can make a distinction between the gatherings together like gathering the rays of light through a magnifying glass to a single point that can really get something done. Um, we can recognize that we can do that healthy form of coalescing without uh, suffering the contraction that you know, has been our habit. Beautiful. Uh, and by the way, just so you know, I will always have read everything in the chat. Uh, I'll, and I'll catch up if I've missed anything. All right. Oh, beautiful. Beautiful. Okay. Very, very good. Um, ah, beautiful. So I'm going to quote Dan Brooke uh, offered us a quote from Mary Oliver. You might see it at 17 minutes past the hour, um, titled, To Live in This World. You must be able to do three things. To love what is mortal, to hold it against your bones, knowing your own life depends on it, and when the time comes to let it go, to let it go. Thank you, Mary Oliver, and thank you, Dan. All right, we're going to finish up. Um, good, good, good. So, and 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 to be. Clear also, I have described coalescing you know, and dispersing as distinct. I invite you into this sort of co-op, sort of opportunity for insight, to intuit, to sense, to embody the larger process that includes both of these. Hmm. Do 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 do. What might that be? 
Thanks, Brenda. I appreciate that. <laughs> Back at you. Uh, anyway, yeah, in your life all together. And can you enjoy? Can you enjoy both of them? You know, and there will be an ultimate dispersing. All eddies disperse eventually. And maybe as we disperse, we will open out into an eternal, timeless mystery that in some sense has, dare I say, coalesced in some way uh, at some timeless time or other. Anyway, thank you very much. Thanks for uh, going on this ride with me. Giddy up. And I look forward to seeing you next week. And, and I really invite you into uh, deepening your own personal exploration uh, of this inquiry. Take good care. Bye-bye.